How's it going, everyone? Uh, my name is Jamar Balassi, and today I'd like to tell you my story, my journey of growth, which takes, past, it takes place over the past 19 years, where <laughs> how I started as an anteater entering the corporate world and then became a Navy combat cameraman. And there is a camera on my hip. It's just out of frame. And then reinvented myself again as a UX designer at Amazon. And along the way, I'd like to tell you about three lessons that I came away with that I used to establish myself in my career around preparation that is incremental, sustainable, and uses your current skills, a mindset that treats every interaction as another data point and reflection that dives deep on how to improve. So the way I'd like to run it is just we can keep it dynamic if you have questions. I can't really see the chat window. So um, you know you can go ahead and unmute and stop me and interrupt. Uh, let, let's run it that way. So let's jump in. But before that, I want to give you a little bit of context. Um, you know, I joined the Navy originally trying to become a Navy SEAL. So I quit my job and I trained for a year straight and I was trying to compress a lifetime of fitness into just 12 months. And um, just to give you a little, a, little, a little more background around that, I think I could do two pull-ups on a good day. And my roommates uh, at the time were just like, oh man, you're a little crazy. This is probably not gonna end well for you. Is what it, but you know, I was really reckless at the time and uh, my athletic resume wasn't really uh, very impressive. You know, in college, I, I played a lot of video games, so <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time doing physical activity. And this is what happened. Big surprise, I passed out. My core temp was 106. So on the morning of July 27, 2009, we were on a four-mile timed run, and uh, I was maybe six feet from the finish line, and then I, I hit the sand. And at the time, I was hiding that I had pneumonia because I didn't want to get medically rolled back or dropped altogether. And just before that, I had recovered from a fractured tibia. And so all of it uh, came crashing down. I, you know, I built my house out of straw, and I got dropped. You know, I, I wasn't prepared for the rigors of this type of training. And yes, there is a circle here around two IV bags. So they really had to go the extra mile to save me. You know, I went, I went hard and I pushed my body and I broke, but it didn't stop me because I healed up. And eventually I, you know, taught myself uh, photography. I submitted a portfolio to Combat Camera and, you know, thankfully I was selected. I volunteered for the scuba dive school, <clears throat> pardon me, and then graduated and you know, was sent on, on deployment. And now I was able to make it through that program because I wasn't starting from scratch. You know, I had trained to what I thought was a high intensity level, but not enough to make it through SEAL training. But even in failing in that program, I learned a lot about how to eat right, how to train at a proper intensity, and then how to properly recover. So when I went on deployment, uh, that brings me to my first lesson that I learned is around preparation, keeping it incremental and sustainable and also uses your current skill set. So incremental progress. I didn't get any dive photo training before I went on deployment. I learned diving and photography separately, and I had to put it together on the job. So this isn't my first photo. It was someone's out of focus elbow, which is horrible. I mean, there's so many bad things about this photo. And I knew I needed to improve. But um, I remembered what happened when I tried to force progress, when I tried to compress that growth. Uh, and I wanted to learn at a level where I could perform in high stress and also high risk situations. So the situation was, I had six minutes, every dive uh, to improve. So what I did is I picked one skill, and then I worked on it until I could do it without thinking. So six minutes at a time, I worked on buoyancy control, 
I worked on spacing. I worked on my flash position and also memorizing the button layout because it's not always, I mean, sometimes it's pretty dark down there. And all of that in six minutes at a time. And so, you know, nine months later, there is some improvement. And it happens every day. So it happened for me every day at such a slow rate that I didn't ever notice the, uh, the gain uh, day over day. But month over month, you can see that it's trending upwards. And so the result is that th these minutes, these minutes of, uh, uh, these minutes built mastery for me. And then also outside of diving, what I tried to do was balance my life. So I made time to work out. I planned calls back home while on deployment. And I made sure to get plenty of rest because I didn't want to break. I didn't want to burn out like I did. And, you know, part of what I did at the end of this is I ended my enlistment by helping establish a training pipeline to train new underwater photographers so that they could go through the same learnings that I did, but at an accelerated rate. And they wouldn't have to do all of the, um, the searching on their own. And they could just, you know, focus on, focus on the job. So in 2014, I entered the civilian job market. And yeah, that mustache is real. Well, it's made of real hair, but it's not mine. So um, part, of, part of what I did during my transition is I moved into project management work. So I used my Navy experience to, uh, and I translated that into PM, PM type work. So the Navy, we have these things called warfare qualifications. So CB combat warfare, scuba, all the way to expeditionary. These are all, you can think of them as specialized project management professional certificates. Um, so I use those as ours and it was a clear mapping of this abstract skill set that employers were, were looking at and it, it really translated it to something, something real for them, something actionable. And because this was my strongest translatable skill, this is how I got my start. So I knew I wanted to enter tech, but how was I going to do it? I, I had been, I hadn't been programming for, you know, more than six years. So those skills were, were pretty rusty. Like the, the programming languages and paradigms have moved on since then. So I, you know, I had a, a variety of PM jobs and I eventually ended up in 2015 at Symantec and I was doing this mixed uh, type work. So PM, uh, hybrid role, and there were no designers in my org. There were designers at Semantic, but just not in my org. And when they released um, a redesign of the support portal, I saw an opportunity there because I noticed that there was no, um, what do you call it? There, were no de there was no design process around how we made decisions. So the, P the product managers and the devs weren't design informed. And so I, with, without going to design school or a design boot camp, I just bought a book on design. It was the elements of user experience. I went on YouTube University. I learned everything I could about sketch and I just taught myself the basics. And I learned as I went. And so a few months after doing this, I just became the person that uh, people in my org came to for design support. And then eventually, my work, you know, semantic, they, they did pay for training. So I do have some uh, actual school uh, under my belt. But the, the real way that I broke into design was just by finding the opportunity. And so after, like, you know, after five years of working there, in, in sorry, in 2019, they got acquired by Broadcom. And so I started looking for jobs at that point. I became a designer kind of backwards. I didn't have to make a portfolio to begin with. And I didn't even know how design interviews were conducted. So I just got out there in the market. Two years of interviews, about 100 rejections, and 15 final rounds before uh, I finally made it to Amazon. Which brings me to my second lesson learned. You got to have the right mindset. And I, we've all heard of a growth mindset, but this is a bit more of a tactical uh, approach to it. So you apply, you get data, 
as you recalibrate. Rejection is just another data point, and each new thing you learn has a compound effect on, on everything else. So I was getting down on myself. You know, I, I said I had a, a ton of rejections, uh, but I, I just approached it as, <laughs> as another point for learning. So what worked for me is not trying to chase down every, was not trying to chase down every opportunity. I just focused on my niche, aligning my strengths to a company's need, and then ignoring the things that I couldn't control. So here's an example. This is the first slide of my portfolio, and it's just experience design, code, and design systems. And these are the things that I had been working on at Symantec, and so I wasn't going to uh, market myself as a visual designer, even though that's something I definitely want to work on. The second thing is that uh, ignoring the things you can't control. These are real things that happen to me. And so you can do everything. I did, there were times when I felt like I did the entire interview as best as I could, but I wasn't getting the offer. You know, I, I found my niche, I prepared properly, but it wasn't happening. Why? And there's just so many things out of out of my control and I realized that, okay, yeah, this is <laughs> this one. I passed the semifinal round, and then the, the, the other round, the final round came three months later. And another interview, the hiring manager was literally on his phone the whole time during my uh, portfolio presentation, and then again in our one-on-one. -on -one. And there was another time where I solved the real problem, and, it, and I never heard back. I never heard back from them at all. And then one of the more recent ones is, where they changed the job rec after the final round. So, I mean, the, the point here that I learned is that companies are really also trying to figure out how to find the best candidates, just as I was trying to figure out how to show my best self. And that, you know, that's okay. You can only control things that are in your, in your power. But it also led me to my third point. So my third lesson, is you gotta you gotta reflect. Yeah, sometimes you gotta dive deep, and that is me on a toilet underwater. There's a lot of weird stuff underwater, and I think to the left there's a bridge. This just some <laughs> really incredible things you'll find down there. In the military, we call this after action. So it's like a lessons learned or a retrospective. And so I took that and I decided to uh, reflect on it. Right. And so here's here's what I came up with is you gotta get feedback because you can't just reflect in a vacuum. If you're trying to improve at photography, you should ask people who are experts in photography because if you don't, then most people are just gonna be okay with just telling you, yeah, it looks great, but not giving you real advice on how to improve. And so, you know, I reached out and I uh, found some mentors to help me out. Second thing is get to the point quickly. And this is because it's business communication. So avoid long preambles and just bottom line up front. And then the last piece is practice until it's natural. You can have the best, um, the best routine. You can have the best content, but if you're just really monotone and droning on and you say you're really excited, no one's really gonna care. No, your message is gonna be incongruent. And so I would just practice. And I got a lot of live practice. I had a lot of rejection. So I had a lot of time to um, hone my, my delivery. On that. So here, here, here we go. Here's an example. This is an early version of some of my main content, and this is it. This is literally what should be 50% of my presentation, but I thought that I could impress people by showing just how this, how this is all wired up, super crazy, and that I would get the job. But this is not helpful. And it took one of my mentors telling me, "You got to dive deeper." And so, you know, I I did that. I would walk. I would walk people through, I would walk the hiring manager through my thought process. I would show them before and after shots. I would really paint a more clear picture, you know, more, more, than, just, more than just this. And it, each time I did this, I got closer and closer to my goal. And so I said 15 final rounds. This is basically a year ago. This is the night before my 16th final round. So at this point, my son is five weeks old and I'm 
trying to rock him to sleep. <laughs> and so we, let, let's talk about preparation, right? Two years of exploring and iterating on my approach. I printed out uh, my responses to basically every version of every question that I had received. And that's, that's that document you see under my orange phone. And then I have a solutions framework for uh, design challenges that I had practiced and that's taped up on the wall. And I'm reviewing my portfolio, which by the 10th rejection, 10th final round rejection, I had heard every question that could possibly be asked about my portfolio. By the 12th, I could problem solve through whiteboard challenges. And then by the 14th, I realized that it was really just about fit in the team and a little bit of luck. So mindset, I was sleep deprived and my son didn't really go to sleep until like 3 a.m. So it was tough. But as another data point, I was thinking I could test under stress the result of my learning. Because before, before this, there wasn't a whole lot of um, iteration on major changes to how I approached it. It was just small tweaks. And then reflection. So I got the offer, right? But on March 2nd, I got, I got the offer. So 16 final rounds, but I'm still, even today, finding ways for me for, to improve, to improve as a designer. Not because uh, I wanna get good at interviews, but just I wanna, I wanna succeed in my career. I wanna, I wanna, learn, wanna learn more. And so I say 16 rounds, right? Over two years, but really it's 19 years. It's 19 years of growth and struggle. And also, you know, I was really hesitant to share my story because I went to SEAL train. It's, it's just really embarrassing sometimes when I think about it. It's just such a spectacular failure in, on such a public stage. And it was super embarrassing. It took a lot for me to even give this talk, but I realized that I could help people with what I've learned. So if you're thinking of starting the next chapter and all this seems really overwhelming, it seems like a lot, my one call to action for you is to just tell, tell your story, not just the wins, but also the times where you learned, maybe you fell a little short. You'll learn a lot, just like I did. And I'm hoping that by doing that, it sets you on a path where you can find yourself in these really interesting situations where you never thought you'd be. So uh, with that, I'd like to pass it back to you, Jamar. Thanks again for having me. And if there are any questions, let me oh, know. Thank you so much, um, man. So, I mean, the, your, your story is insane. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, going from, you know, um, uh, uh, it's like, you know, people talk about couch to 5k couch to marathon, you went couch to seal training and like, <laughs> so yeah, that, yeah. that in and of itself is insane. So, I mean, hats off, um, as far as, you know, uh, all of your achievements and just the, the amount of, um, uh, uh, uh friction you've, had to go through repeatedly and and actually one of the one of my questions and, and wanted to open it up for everyone feel free to unmute uh just jump in ask any questions um you know we're we're going to keep it pretty pretty dynamic and and just open here but um just one of my questions because i i deal with this a lot um as a as a small business owner just like there's a lot of it's just like you want to be you want to be very um, deliberate around the process. And I, I feel like there's um, this kind of dichotomy where you're, you're you, 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 you want to be, you're like impatient to, to see progress, but you also need to be patient to kind of like, like you said, they like maybe each day you don't see the incremental progress, but maybe it's like over weeks or months you do like go into a little bit of the, your mindset as far as like, how you deal with being in being in the middle of the process and kind of staying with the process. 
you know, I look, I like to look at people who have achieved a high level of mastery. I feel like the things that I'm attracted to require a lot of dedication to achieve. And, and for me, that's where I, I want to get to because I feel like that's where I can start expressing. I can be more expressive. And so when I feel constrained by my lack of skill and the speed of progress, I just remember that everyone sucked at one point. Some people are just further along than others, even now, right? I'm, I'm a UX designer, but I have senior designers above me who have 15 years of experience. So, I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine the types of like mental models that I can hold, the type of thinking that I can unlock if I just stick with it. That, at, at Symantec, for example, the project that I did where I helped redesign uh, the support website, that couldn't have happened day one mm. because there was so much growth that, that needed to occur within me and then also within the team that I was in. And so when, when I feel impatient, I just take a breath and just like one, one step at a time. One of the coaches that I work with says, greatness happens when you're consistently good. So as long as every day I can put in 100% of what I can allot to whatever task I'm on, then I, I, I can feel okay about it. That's good. Um, how do you balance that with like leisure do you do you do you find especially being a young a young parent as well a parent of a young child that young parent parent of a young child um where do you um do you find that you have good balance as far as the work the and and i don't know if you consider it a grind but the grind and um let's say leisure time yeah the that's an interesting question. So um, in the Navy, we would, uh, especially in BUDS, we would, we would be in this position called the leaning rest. So we're in the push-up position. Our arms are extended. Our backs are straight. We're under tension, but that's rest. And so my approach now that, now that I'm a father is that I have to be comfortable under tension. So Everything is going on, but I have to learn to, to still myself. And it's hard. It's really hard. There are times when I, I just, I need to walk, I need to, to, to walk away. And I think leisure time is very important because it's just like physical training too. You need, you need to rest. You need to rest some way, even though it can't be 100% because you can't just totally shut off. But I feel like it's really important. So, some of the things that I do uh, today is like my wife and I will go on five minute walks, just five minutes a day, just to reset. Um, you know, we have a rule where there's no devices at the table. And I think those short blocks of time where we can have a little bit of a break, even though it's not 100%, are really, uh, it's really rejuvenating for us. And it helps us maintain that, that level performance that we need to both have. That's great. That's great. Any other, any questions out there? I'll just take a little pause since I yeah, just anything. asked a couple in a row. Ask me anything. Go through my notes. I'll jump in if no one has one. All right. Um, Tell me a little bit about the process of finding a mentor. Yeah, I think you have to be okay with reaching out to people. I know I used to be very passive about these types of things and I would just kind of toil away. But if we have, you know, we have platforms like social media now, so you can, that's why I encourage you to, encourage people to tell their story because you never know who's going to reach out or you never know who is reading that post while you're sleeping. Maybe they've walked that path and maybe they can help. I think one thing that I've been trying to work on is just being more open and talking to more people without the expectation that they're going to mentor me. And 
you know, you, it, it's, it'll, it'll just click. I think the times that I've found mentors who I really am on the same wavelength with, it was totally unexpected. It was just a casual conversation that turned into a mentorship. But one of my first mentors as a designer was my neighbor. Hmm. And that was totally random. I was just talking to her and she's like, oh, I, I do design. I was like, oh yeah, me too. And so she gave me a lot of early help and a lot of early feedback in my portfolio just because I was you know, more outside my head. Or do you find, um, do you look for like mentors in like, let's say it's kind of for a given topic or a given area, or do you have like, do you have like multiple mentors? I do. I do. I, th I think just because there are so many aspects of my career that I want to develop, you know, one of, one of them is getting back into, into programming, knock, knocking the rust off. And so I, I have a mentor for that. She's on the call. <laughs> and then an another is uh, about navigating my career and also, you know, navigating through Amazon and, 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 you know, that person's on the call too. And, and both, both of them were just random conversations where I just, I just reached out to them. They were, they were gracious enough to, to offer their help. Have, have you, have you served as a mentor? I, yeah, I do. So I, um, I actually volunteer my time for Hire Heroes. Okay. And they are a veteran organization. And so they, they help me with my transition and then they help me tighten up certain aspects of my, uh, my interview approach. And so now every time they have someone who wants to, uh, you know, enter UX, who's a service member, they, they send them my way. That's really awesome. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. It's been really rewarding. I would imagine, I, I love your adv advice about just kind of telling your story, even though it, it might feel uncomfortable. And I think that um, that kind of feeling of vulnerability is maybe a tough one for people to deal with. Can you, can you tell, can you speak a little bit about how you maybe work through that personally? Mm. Yeah, I had to own my uh, mistakes. It was really, it was kind of ridiculous for me to think that I could make it through SEAL training. Like, if, if you look at the makeup of my class, we had all state swimmers, you know, champion wrestlers, guys who were pre Olympic. You know, they've been training since they were kids and they were, they were just crushing the training. And here I am just playing Counter-Strike in college, just watching a bunch of anime, and I expect to show up and run with a boat on my head. It's just not going to happen, you know? It's not going to happen. I, and at a certain point, because I built that house out of straw, it just, I, just, I just broke. And so I had to own my mistake. You know, when I tell people about it, yeah, I got medically dropped, but it was my fault. I didn't put in the reps. I didn't put in the preparation. And so I, I paid for it. And I, I feel really fortunate to be able to walk away like that. Because there's some people who have really bad, really, really bad injuries, you know, they're really scarred. And like, it, it seems like I got off easy. Yeah. So I just, I, I, I owned it and I, I just started. Uh, the second thing I did was I wrote about it. I wrote a lot about it. So I, I got my thoughts on paper and I, I made it public and it, it helped me analyze it more like a scientist and, and remove that um, emotional content from, from me to see, okay, here are my gaps. I'm not acknowledging that I don't have the skill. So I, I really, ha really had to confront, confront my, uh, the way I looked and approached uh, things that I want to master. No, I, I love that because I think when you get into that, that kind of feeds back into that incremental progress, right? And 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 being kind of self-aware about that, kind of taking taking away that almost the sting of like not feeling like you're enough and being having a, a productive way to deal with that, right? Say, okay, well, I'm not perfect, but also here's an area where I want to get better. 
but I'm not, I'm not there yet. Yeah. How do I now put in the reps to get, to get better? Yeah. Um, I think that's great. Um, Kat, Kat has a question. Okay. Kat, did you want to jump on and ask, or you want me to, you want to go off mute and, and, and ask Jumar? Sure. Jamar, what is hey, hey. next for you oh, in the next, next five to 10 years? Yeah. Talked so a lot I, about your past, but what, what what's going on in the future? Any thoughts? So as, as a kid, I wanted to, I wanted to be Jim Lee. You know, I wanted to be a comic book artist. I wanted to work for image comics. So, so I want to find a way to learn about art 2d or, or 3d and integrate that into my practice. So my, my, my idea, I'm taking art classes now to try and, you know, start that journey. And it's the same thing, just small steps. Right now, all I can do is draw a box. But I'm reading that drawing a box is like very, like a fundamental thing. You, you can learn anatomy from that. You can learn how to turn objects in space. And I feel like, you know, one area I can, I can improve in is, is storyboarding, storytelling, not just writing, but visually. And I feel like that skill will help me improve my uh my interface design as well jamar's being extremely humble he's actually really good at drawing and he <laughs> posts his drawing on instagram so check it out <laughs> what, what's your what's your instagram jamar uh, mind bullets Put it, put it in chat so, yeah, so everyone can follow you. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I suggested posted. that you post so that yeah, you can keep did. them honest yeah. with the, uh, the in oh, improvements yeah. of, of, of learning how to draw and, and, and you know, getting to a, a master state. <laughs> yep. I it's, love it. It's a long Mind bullets. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm gonna go follow you. How do you stay motivated? How do you yeah. stay motivated during your search? You've already been searching, you feel burnt out. Oh, okay, yeah, I was thinking about this last night. So I think your why has to be really strong. So, and it's okay that it changes over time. So for me, uh, you know, why, why do I wanna succeed in my career? I, I and I was talking to uh, one of my mentors about this. I, I want to be able to create a space where my son has more options you know, growing up Filipino American, it was like Navy, nurse, or engineer. And then that's basically it. The conversation didn't really ex extend outside of that. Even for me, computer science was a hard sell because it was just this unknown quantity. But design and maybe other creative fields, I think, are also valid paths for underrepresented uh, people and, you know, you know, minorities to take. So I want him to be able to feel comfortable and see people that look like him that can succeed in this field. So whenever, uh, even now, like, right? Like during, during work, there are times when I'm not so motivated. I, I have to go back to that and, and think that, well, it's more than just delivering this feature. It's more than just designing this UI. It can be bigger for, for the next generation. That's awesome. Uh, Carolyn, uh, did you want to come and uh, ask, ask your question? I just wondered if photography, um, learning photography enhanced your ability as a designer. Obviously, I think it has some relevance to what you want to do next, but I wondered if it. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So one, one thing I, I noticed, was, which was easy for me to pick up, was exploration and iteration. So in photography, we, there's this concept of working the shot. You have an idea for an image that you want to make. And so you find your subject and then you explore different ways to uh, tell that story. Maybe different angles, you know, different, different heights, like different focal lengths. And then once you find one that, that has the emotional impact you're looking for, then you can iterate on that. Maybe you change some settings on your camera. Maybe you change the lighting. Maybe the, the pose is slightly different. So Iteration, exploration and iteration are some, is a thing that is really important when it comes to design because oftentimes your first solution is not the right one or is not the most complete one. So you have to push, you have to find different angles. And then once you find one that resonates with your users, you can iterate and drill down to get it to, to a, a really 
I guess, lovable state. That translated really well. So Jumar, uh, one question. Um, what, what did you think was harder? The physical transformation of being a, a seal, being, being, being a video game player to, to, to being a seal, or the career sort of, and, the, and the, uh, the, that, that evolution, like the mental evolution of, of mastery? I think for me, the, the mindset was more difficult. The, okay, so and my, my view on, on SEAL training is only really up to that first, first point just before Hell Week, so everything preceding that. It's a very limited view, and in that case, it is very physical, right? I never got into um, the other aspects of higher level performance when you're you know, a fully fledged uh, operator. So from my perspective, the physical aspects were, were easier because it's a fixed, it's a finite thing. There's, there's a certain level that you need to achieve. I just, didn't, I just didn't achieve it. You know, if I had to go back and train my younger self, there are certain things that I would do differently for sure. But trying to navigate the mindset shift of a civilian workforce is very non-deterministic. Mm. I, I had no way to know if I was on the right path. Physically, it's very easy to know, oh, I missed the, the cutoff time by five seconds. So I can make a plan to improve by six seconds on my run. But when you go in an interview and you don't get a whole lot of feedback from people because legally they can't give you a lot, you're guessing and you're, you're trying to, to dial in, uh, you're trying to, to calibrate. Sometimes you overshoot, sometimes you undershoot. And it, it was, that's why it took two years for me because I was, I was continually dialing it in to hit this bullseye. And even now, if I had to interview now, the, the bullseye is different. Mm. It, it's just a, a changing landscape. So for me, it was very irregular and very difficult to, to navigate. All right. Well, Jamar, thank you so much uh, for spending time. Um, for me, it's it, it was incredibly motivating, I, and I'm I'm um, uh, I, I kind of want to hit stop on the record so I can go back and watch it again. <laughs> so, um, but no, this was great. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time and 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 jumping in um, and sharing your story, being um, vulnerable and and uh, uh, sharing uh, sharing everything with us. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that that this was this was great. Um, any any parting words before I, I tie a bow on the uh, on the event? Uh, yeah, stay safe. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, thank you, Jamar. Inspirational okay. story. So thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for having me.